Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Spira with Virginia Cancer Specialists, and today I'll be talking about antibody drug conjugates or ADCs for non-small cell lung cancer with a particular attention to HER2 and HER3. Here are my disclosures. Here's the support we're getting for this program. So the objectives today are to understand the role of HER2 and HER3 in non-small cell lung cancer, We'll review patient selection for treatment with antibody drug conjugates against these targets, and we'll highlight different approaches towards targeting HER2-mutated non-small cell lung cancer. So first, we'll talk about HER3, and this is a complicated side, but one we've seen not uncommonly. To remind everybody, HER3 is a member of the uh, HER-B or HER, HER protein kinase family. There's a lot of inter interactions, as you can see here, and it usually starts with the ligand binding the uh, EGFR homodimer at the beginning of this pathway, and there's obviously a big signaling cascade. By itself, it lacks tyrosine kinase activity, and HER3 itself is not an oncoprotein, but heterodimerizes with other tyrosine kinases to activate oncogenic signaling. HER3 expression can mediate resistance to targeted therapy, for example, resistance to EGFR-targeted therapies in lung cancer. What is the role in oncogenesis? So as you can see, ligand binding leads to heterodimerization of receptor tyrosine kinases with HER3. Cytoplasmic oncogenic signaling is activated, particularly here by the PI3K, AKT, and mTOR pathways, uh, with other pathways involved as well. And the signaling leads to cell proliferation and blocks apoptosis. In other words, makes cancer cells grow. And of course, the end result is pr promote cancer cell survival, proliferation, and progression with lots of other mechanisms of action as well. We'll now look at HER3 expression in non-small cell lung cancer. HER3 mutations or HER3 amplification actually is not commonly seen. So we're not seeing mutations in this gene or amplification of the gene, but there is expression, as you can see here by IHC, in over 80% of cancers and lots of different ways of looking at it. But the tissue microarray studies shows that many of these have uh, uh, exp just expression of, of the protein. And as you can see here on the slide, the purple, I'm sorry, the brown represents uh, expression of the protein in both the primary lung cancers as well as in brain metastases as well. We'll now talk about some of the drug development, and the one that's most far advanced is petritumab deruxtecan. This is a novel HER3-targeted antibody drug conjugate. And we've seen lots of antibody drug conjugates, but to remind everybody, there's three parts. The antibody, which binds the HER3, the linker, which connects the antibody to the payload, and of course, the payload. So the analogy I like to use is smart bombs. You're, driving, you're binding the HER3 protein and bringing in along with it a targeted chemotherapy approach. And in this case, petritumab uh, has an exotecan derivative. It's a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which is fairly potent. It's cleavable. There's cleavable and non-cleavable linkers. And these work by two ways. One is they directly kill the cell itself, but there's also bystander killing. So some of the payload when binding a cancer cell can leak uh, immediately adjacent to it. Remember, there's obviously a lot of cancer cells together, and this causes a bystander killing effect as well. So you're killing not only the tumor cell, but some of these cells adjacent to it. Here's the design. This is from a friend and colleague, Dr. Passiani, presented at ASCO several years ago, but looking at petritumab deruxtecan. This is the phase one study looking at petritumab deruxtecan in pretreated EGFR mutated non small cell lung cancer. So, a subset of non small cell lung cancer that's uh, EGFR mutated. Again, not looking at HER3 mutations, but looking at downstream from the heterozymer, heterodimer uh, interaction. So these are patients that were treated in a dose escalation phase one at several different cohorts. And finally, the dose expansion was at 5.6 milligrams per kilogram. Um, this is a pooled population looked at in the phase one. Uh, biopsies were looked at for HER3 expression, but there was not any selection based upon HER3 expression, recalling that over 80% of tumors had at least IHC staining for HER3 expression. And there was both an efficacy and a safety toler uh, safety uh, cohort. Patient characteristics in the study, what you would typically expect from this patient population. Again, EGFR mutated, average age 65. Uh, most patient, Many patients had a history of brain metastases, up to nine lines, median lines of therapy were four. Everybody got it, everybody got it prior to TKI as, we do it ex as you would expect. 
On the right, we'll look at the re recommended phase two dosing cohort at 5.6 mg per kilogram, confirmed response rate of 39%, mostly PRs, a lot of stable disease as well. So a disease control rate, clinical benefit rate is the other way we think about this at 72%. Median time to response was fairly quickly at 2.6 months and a duration of response, 6.9 months with a PFS of 8.2 months. We'll now look at HER2 mutant non-small cell lung cancer and we're learning a lot more about this. So this is different, right? Now we're talking about not overexpression, but mutations. And this is a similar thought process to EGFR mutations. So as you look at the slides here, there's a lot of dimerization, there's a lot of interactions here, but now we're looking at specific mutations in the receptor tyrosine kinase. So this is similar to, as you would think about EGFR mutations or any other mutated gene, which is causes overexpression or uh, con uh, constant signaling of these pathways because there's a mutation in the gene. Uh, in the... Uh, most of these occur inside the cellular surface in the tyrosine kinase domain, and there's been a lot of drug development here, so a lot of drug development. So as you can see in the small molecule world, we have these HER, uh, HER TKIs, so dacamitinib, afatinib. Um, there's been looking at other ones developed in breast cancer, such as neratinib, lapatinib, and tucatinib, as well as a lot of novel therapies. Uh, as well, pyrotinib, posiotinib, mobocertinib, uh, tarlox, uh, as well as some other ones coming down uh, the pike as well, currently in clinical development and may be approved soon. Of course, today, since we're talking about antibody drug conjugates, we'll be looking at things that bind the extracellular surface. And again, you could target this with trastuzumab, which is just a monoclonal antibody, and there's anecdotal data of some of these monoclonals working. Uh, as well as antibody drug conjugates. We can learn from our breast cancer colleagues. They've been using uh, adotrastuzumab as well as trastuzumab deruxtecan here uh, in terms of binding. So you're looking at patients with these mutations, um, but obviously using the fact that these proteins are expressed in the cell surface and binding them with antibody drug conjugates here. So slightly different uh, than the HER3 story. Now, looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan is the one we're going to be talking about today. So again, antibody drug conjugate, it's from the same company. So a very similar construct to patritumab, just a different antibody. And that's the unique thing about these antibody drug conjugates. You have an antibody, a linker, and then the payload, and you can mix and match these. Uh, technology is complicated, but now can be done relatively easy. And we're seeing a lot of these. So now we'll look at the Destiny Lung O2 study. So this is the primary results of patients with HER2 mutant metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So these are patients who have a HER2 mutation in their lung cancer, again, not overexpression, but a HER2 mutation in their lung cancer and looking at how well they do with TDXD. And as you can see here, two patient populations either 5.4 or 6.4 milligram per kilogram. And as you can see, response rates are actually higher uh, I'm sorry, we're about the same in both patient population, 49 and 56%. Uh, most of these were partial responses, 48 and 52% respectively, with a disease control rate, again, similar to clinical benefit rate of over 90% in both of these arms, with a duration of response uh, of over a year in the 5.4 milligram per kilogram cohort, actually 16.8 months with a pretty quick time to response here. So as you can see, TDXD, in this EGFR immune population does appear to have a fairly impressive both response rate and clinical benefit rate with a quick time to response as well as a response rate that is over 16 months in the 5.4 milligram cohort. These are waterfall plots that we love to see. Uh, as you can see, almost everybody has some kind of a clinical benefit here as well. When we think about mutations in the HER2 gene, you can get these in two spots, as you recall, from that initial slide. You can get them in the kinase domain, which is intracellular, or in the extracellular domain itself. Almost all of these are in the kinase domain, rarely in the extracellular domain. So the N here in the extracellular domain is relatively small, but as you can see, it appears clearly in the kinase domain, as well as the limited number of patients with mutations in the extracellular domain, benefiting almost all patients as well. These patients, some of these were very heavily pre-treated as well. One of the things we're looking at, and this is where it gets to be complicated, for those of you who treat breast cancer or 
most of us are familiar with the breast cancer world, we've always talked about HER2 amplification. And in fact, TDXD and trastuzumab by itself has been, a, trastuzumab was approved for patients with HER2 amplification for quite some time. Uh, the world obviously migrated. Uh, now we're looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan. Now even patients with minimal HER2 uh, amplification and expression. Uh, but as you can see, some of these patients with mutations also have amplification as well. And we have to obviously tease these out as to what difference it makes also. But most of the benefit that has been looked at here is actually in patients with HER2 mutation. Let's now take this a step further. We'll look at zongertinib, and this is a TKI. So we talked before about antibody drug conjugates. Now we're going to talk about small molecules, what we traditionally think about. So small molecules, again, get intracellular binding, number one. They tend to almost always be oral. And we'll look at the Beamian Lung 1 study. So this is a phase 1A, 1B study looking at zongertinib. Uh, it's got a nickname we call it Zongo. Uh, but this is a HER2 TKI, sort of the the one that's the farthest along and probably been the most uh, most effective so far. We talked briefly about some other ones. So this is the Beamian Lung 1 study. The study design uh, started as a phase 1 study and then I developed a dose expansion cohort, as you can see the different doses here. And the dose expansion, uh, multiple different cohorts, either pre-treated, first line, um, active brain mets, and also patients that got a HER2 ADC as well. What we're trying to learn about as well is for patients who've gotten one of these molecules, does the other one work? So if you had an ADC, does the TKI work because it works differently? And of course, vice versa. This is the preliminary data. There's gonna be a lot more data presented later this year. So 23% patients response rate, 74% in the small group of patients uh, here as well. Looking at safety, treatment-related adverse events. Of course, a lot of patients have treatment-related adverse events as you would expect. Um, the first utility analysis was passed. And in fact, we believe and hope that this drug may be hitting uh, approval sometime into 2025. Uh, not final yet, but it's currently sitting there for approval as well. Major side effects from this drug are TKI side effects, so what you would expect to see, GI side effects, diarrhea, as well as a rash as well. And we hope to see some updated data along with potentially approval for this later this year. So again, to conclude, the HER2 and HER3 are very promising targets for these antibody drug conjugates. Trastuzumab deruxtecan, we call TDXD, as well as patrinumab deruxtecan. TDXD, at the time of this recording, is currently approved. Patrinumab may be approved later this year. We've talked also about some TKIs that are coming down the pike for HER2 mutation. Again, to reiterate, keeping in mind the difference between, especially in the HER2 world, HER2 overexpression, commonly seen in breast cancer, as well as other cancers as well, but also specifically in the lung cancer world, looking at um, mutations as well, where we're both seeing efficacy from Zongo, Zongertinib, as well as PDXD. Thank you very much.